Okay, what's going on, you guys? Uh, back at it again with another uh, podcast, the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Kwan, founder of Cannabis Marketing. We're the number one marketing agency for cannabis dispensaries, both in the U.S. and in Canada. And I'm joined, joined here with Jenna, uh, the Cannabis and Licensing Regulatory Specialist from CLE. Uh, she's going to go and talk about exactly what CLE is and all the licensing and all that fun stuff to do with dispensaries and cannabis businesses. So Jenna, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. No worries, no worries. Happy to, to finally make this happen anyways. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about CLE and what CLE is exactly. Yeah, so I've been uh, in the cannabis space for about five years now. I originated working at a, a law firm doing all licensing and compliance for clients across, mostly across California. Um, I recently joined the CLE team. As a licensing and regulatory specialist, we'll be working on their applications and compliance with them um, and excited to join their team. Um, so that's a little bit about, about where I've come from. <laughs> and then a little bit about CLE. Yeah, so the CLE has done a lot of uh, great progress in the cannabis space. They were one of the um, first groups to get licensed in Canada um, have really kind of taken Canada over by storm and have spread out and now have gone internationally and uh, breaking into the American market. Um, they are have different, they are more than just licensing. Um, they are a broad, really a broad space from kind of full scale business management. You can get HR consulting, you can get banking consulting, you can get financing consulting beyond just licensing. Um, so they are really a broad spectrum company. Um, I'm happy to join the team. <laughs> right, right. So uh, a lot of the stuff you mentioned, it's like very consultative based. So um, is it mostly like a full service thing where you kind of handheld, handhold all of the kind of clients that you work with, or is it more so like a partnership with you and dispensary owner, for example? Um, I would say a partnership with a, with a dispensary owner and, and consulting. Um, so I think we, we introduce people, dispensaries to the appropriate, um, appropriate team members. You can kind of help them go from um, zero to 100 once they get their permits and really kind of help them with their grow their operations. Right, right. So uh, taking a look at your website, there's a bunch of stuff, right? There's like all the stuff you mentioned about the consulting stuff, uh, but the R&D, uh, working with growers, uh, working, you know, uh, on the, the, the seed side, on the growing side and stuff like that, right? But just for the purposes of our conversation, we'll kind of keep it with the licensing stuff because that'll probably fit in with the audience a little bit better. Um, so I'm in uh, Canada, right? And what is the process if I'm looking to to get a license and I want to work with you guys? What does that process look like? Uh, well, first, um, to work with us, we would probably have a, a consultation um, and get gather what your operations are, what you're looking to achieve, where are you at, um, and giving you a, a full scale breakdown of, of what you need to do to get a dispensary from uh, budgeting and finance to what jurisdictions are, are open um, right. to, you know, what activity that you're looking to do, what you can do. Um, and, and whatnot, and then we'll take you from there and uh, get you started from the, the ground up to do your, your full scale licensing. Right. And does that, so, you know, I'm, I'm super, super excited and I want to open up like 10 different locations at once, right? Um, does the process look different if I already have a license for one store versus like, if I just want to go and do 10 licenses, like, again, this, this kind of world about the, the regular, the regulations and all that stuff is like very, very new to me. So I apologize if I'm asking very simple questions. Um, but for, for the more, mostly for the people who want to start out, like, you know, is there any, does it make it easier now that I have a license to open up more locations? Like, you know, how does that all work? Um, it makes it easier in the sense that you're familiar with the process, um, depending on where you're open um, in the States, a lot of the markets are kind of modeled very similar to each other. You can see right. a lot of the, the familiar requirements and uh, business property and entity formation, budget plans, things like that. You kind of have an understanding for it. Right. Um, that being said, every, every state, every jurisdiction is different in the laws and what you 
uh, what kind of activities can you do, um, even down to like packaging and labeling, you know, those regula regulations change, um, you know, who can be an owner who is prohibited for being an owner, things like that. Right. Can you be a, a vertically integrated company um, or, or not? Sometimes they're prohibited. So it's getting to know the particular laws of each area that you're looking into is, um, is the, the hurdle, I guess, or what you need to, to focus on. Right. So I'm sure this this question is very it, it definitely varies. Um, but what is the general timeline from hey I I want to start a, a store right to the store being up? Um, yeah, it definitely varies. I'm sure, I'm sure it does. I would say um, I would say on average you want to give yourself at least a year. Um, the application process and going through the reviews and getting approvals um, can take a, quite a long time. If you, in California, for example, um, you have, first you have to get local approval from your city um, or, or county, and then you have to get a state approval. Right. Um, and you can't get a state approval until you have local. So um, the timeline kind of stretches out there. And I would say give people, um, yeah, at least a year before you can open those doors. Right. And are you finding the majority of people who apply are getting rejected or? Um, no, actually, I personally, and I know with CLE, there um, haven't had any rejections of licenses. Right. Um, it does, it can happen. Um, uh, I would say sometimes uh, a rejected license um, could be incomplete materials and they weren't able to fulfill the requirements when the, the you know, the agency asked for them. Okay. Um, perhaps there was an issue with the owners, um, you know, coming down to a background check or the, the corporation right. uh, that, that's being applying for, um, or maybe insufficient capital or, or whatnot. So there are instances where, of course, it will happen. Um, and that's the benefit of working with a, a consultant like CLE who has the knowledge and experience to um, get you through that finish line. You guys have essentially done it a million times so that obviously you can properly tell somebody what to expect instead of them just jumping into the fire and not knowing what to do, right? Exactly, yeah. Perfect. So just to quickly summarize for those that are listening, uh, the, the three kind of main things that you pointed out was like lack of capital. Maybe they had a bunch of money at the start and then it took a lot more money, uh, you know, later on. Uh, background check speaks for itself. Um, and then incomplete, incomplete materials. What exactly do you mean by incomplete materials? Like how does that end up resulting in a rejected application? Um, so it could vary. I mean, there are sometimes um, agencies, they might require an environmental sustainability plan, um, neighborhood compatibility plan. Uh, maybe you don't have the appropriate partnerships with your local um, local businesses, local enterprises, things right. like that. Right. Um, if you don't provide the appropriate financial documentation, um, you know, there's a there's a number of things that are required, and right. usually um, jurisdictions they want to help you. So if you submit an application and it's incomplete, it doesn't mean check all their boxes and. Uh, don't have all the requirements, they'll give you a time frame to, right. to um, provide those items. And if you don't, and it's still insufficient, then at that point, they might deny you. Right. Are there, are there do-overs? Like if you fail the first time, like, can you, can you do it again? Or are they like, Hey, you messed up the first time. This is it. Uh, no, I mean, it depends on the, on the rules, um, but usually you can apply again. Um, you know, it'd be really up to you. The uh, application fees are, can be pretty costly. Um, so if you're willing to go through the process again and uh, re uh, repay for that application fee, then um, yeah, most times you can resubmit. Um, and not including your guys' consultation fees, what, again, I'm sure this varies state by state, mm -hmm. country by country, right? You know, what would be a good ballpark estimate for, you know, you think people or partners and stuff to have in that war chest to be a good starting amount? to end up starting getting the license? Yeah, absolutely. I think from um, just permitting and licensing, I would say a good average, um, 10 to 15,000, and okay. they can be less, they can go upwards of 50 or 60,000. Right. Um, I think overall, 
to, to get you up and running, depending on what, what activity you're going for, of course, um, I would say you would want at least 100 to 150 um, right. in control ready to go. Right. A lot of the times, places, uh, you'd have to have a property secured um, before you can apply. So if you okay. don't own the building and you have to rent it, you know, you're, you're putting money towards monthly rent um, while you're getting permits and it's kind of sitting there, which can be a burden. So uh, yeah, you do need a lot of, of capital on hand to um, be able to open your doors. For sure. So I can imagine that that slight nuance of owning the property before you get the license also becomes a big headache because, you know, Delays. I'm sure there are many delays, as with a lot of permits and regulation stuff. You have yeah. this property, and it just kind of sits there, and you don't even know if it could be used for the thing that you bought it for. Like, does does that is that a common thing? Uh, your property is a big is a big hurdle. Um, if you're renting, for example, you're dealing with landlords, um, you know, a lot of the times they don't want cannabis in in the to be rented out to. Um, you know, they, there's still a lot of kind of stigma and education and, and awareness around these uh, uh, businesses. And most of the times landlords will just prefer not to, not to deal with it. They see it as an issue. Um, or if they are willing, they kind of know that um, they have the power in their hands, so to speak. So uh, rental costs can be increase dramatically because they know you have limited options. Right. Um, these spaces have to be in certain zoning areas and comply with uh, location restrictions to schools and other sensitive uses, you know, alcohol and rehab centers, things like that. So you, your pool of uh, locations that you can open slims down, shrinks a lot. And so landlords know they kind of have you in the, in the palm of your hand. Right. And, can oftentimes increase the rent on you. <laughs> right, right. So I, look, just even based off the small things that you said, you just mentioned a lot of things that I, I would have, like, I wouldn't even think about, right? You know, proximity <laughs> to schools, you know, having, you know, the location and stuff like that. So that kind of leads me into that question about like, you know, what, like, what do you do? And, you know, why, like, why what you do is, why? Do you do why what you do is important for dispensary owners? Essentially, you know, why is your service valuable for people who are looking to get a license? That's pretty much the question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we um I've done a number of zoning verifications, you right. know, um, and I think speaking to what we were talking about early in denial, sometimes a property um, location will be insufficient and can be denied just on that based off of the fact that it's in the incorrect zone or it's too close to a school, doesn't meet those buffer requirements, things like right. that. Um, so, you know, myself and CLE, we do that zoning verification um, for you to make sure that the property that you have or intend to open up in is compliant based off of the rules and you can actually operate there. Right. And then is, is, you know, you mentioned that the property is probably one of, if not the biggest hurdle. Are there any other kind of hurdles that are similar to something like that, where you're like, oh, this is also poses a big issue? Um, in terms of licensing and getting those permits, I would say, yeah, property, uh, property and capital are really the biggest property hurdles. Um, if you're if you're doing it on your own um, and you're not consulting with a with a consulting firm or an attorney if you, if you went down that route you want to do it all on your own um i think there could be uh, potential for more delays just from lack of experience really and um, dealing with the different agencies review right. times can i think extend a little bit right. um there's a lot of rules and, and regulations to get through and drafting standard operating procedures, which is kind of routine for us now, you know. Um, fun SOPs, like you you hate to do them, but you have to, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it really helps having someone in your corner who knows who to speak to at the, you know, at the state or local agency um, who can maybe even try and lobby on your behalf and making those connections with the local municipalities and um, know where to go to find the rules and the applications and just kind of be able to, to tackle that really helps having someone who knows the space. Right, right. So you mentioned the lobbying portion. So, you know, the, the property and the capital, 
two biggest bottlenecks, right? Uh, obviously, you help with the zoning stuff and the property stuff. Do you help with any of the capital stuff, like you know, raising funding, you know, with people who need that help? Um, we do have some services that we can, uh, I believe, set you up with partners to help you find okay. investors and partners to relieve that capital. Right. Right. That makes sense. Um, and then, you know, once, once I get my location, I worked with you guys, had a lovely experience. It was seamless and nothing went, at all went wrong. There was no fires to put out or anything like that. Um, you know, uh, after I get my license, what are some of the common things that you find dispensary owners do that they really shouldn't be doing? Shouldn't be doing. Um, I think one challenge a lot for dispensary owners, um, it comes to taxes and, taxes, okay. and accounting. Um, so it, taxes are, are, are a big, big hurdle for cannabis businesses in general. Um, they are generally taxed at a higher rate, um, than most other industries out there and with limited options for, um, you know, claiming deductions or anything like that on your, on your tax returns. Right. Um, they are also, you can pretty much expect to be audited at some point um, by, by the IRS. Um, so making sure that you have good accounting um, and record keeping procedures in place is crucial. Right. Um, and working with a, with a CPA or an accountant who's familiar, I would say is very important as well. Um, in, inspection, random inspections or scene inspections are also very common. And, um, and I've come across it a lot from different, different clients in the past who um, um, maybe don't know the regulations that were, they were supposed to follow or just decided right. not to follow them. Um, and, you know, that can get you into trouble and jeopardize, um, not only jeopardize your license, but you can face penalties, um, which can be quite costly. And you don't want anything to um, force you to, to close down your doors while you have to right. fix a violation or whatnot. Right. And is that a service that you guys help with that as well? Or is that more so like, hey, look out for these things? Again, more so on a consultative basis. Yeah, in a compliance capacity. Um, so kind of making sure you're prepared for inspections, um, know what they're going to be looking for. Uh, you know, we uh, provide services like checking, packaging, and labeling. So making sure that your products are ready to be sold and that there are no problems there. Um, kind of giving you those checks and balances to make sure that you are staying in line with the regulations. Right, right, right. Um, so, you know, we spoke about this at the beginning, spoke about how like there's different states, there's different countries that, you know, then there's different ways that people want to build businesses, whether it's just a single mom and pop or being vertically integrated and stuff like that. Um, so just so that we cover just kind of each of these segments, uh, you know, can you just walk me through kind of the different projects you're working on from like, okay, small mom and pop, maybe one, one, two, and three to all the way to like an MSO and essentially what that looks like from, you know, just starting them up, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I guess just starting off um, working with a, with a new client would be to one, understand what their, what their operations are, what activity they're looking to get into. Um, do we at least have an understanding of that? Do they have a property secured yet? Um, what's that looking like? Do they need help with that? Um, what is their, what's their company? Who's their, what's their entity? Who are the owners? Who needs to get, you know, background checks taken care of and, and things like that. So the majority, um, sorry to interrupt, the majority of the people who are coming in they already have entities that they say that this is going to be my cannabis brand or they come in before then and then you tell them that they they need to get this stuff set up um it varies okay. some people need you to form a, a corporation for them or some people sure. have already got one in line yeah it depends on what stage they are in the process sure okay sorry continue <laughs> no yeah no, of course um yeah and so um and Kind of really going from from there and then just kind of getting into the nitty gritty application part of it in terms of where they're at of course what are the rules and getting all the materials together drafting all the procedures and, and whatnot and then getting them submitted so right. um yeah that's kind of the, the basics from you know when from the beginning to end <laughs> right. 
So, so that, that same process applies, whether it's uh, like an MSO or just like one person coming in, you got to figure out what their needs are. And based on what on their needs, they're going to, you're going to have to curate what the specific plan looks like for their, their key objectives. Right. Right. Yeah. I would say also for an MSO or, you know, vertically integrated companies as well. Um, if they, you know, they were assuming that they might have, you know, operations in existence in other states. Correct. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, we need to know how the regulations are going to be affected by this new state. Um, are, what corporation or entity are they, do they plan to apply under and how does that going to change in the, in the, in their current state that they're looking to open another business in? Right. Um, how does their business model need to change in terms of operations to meet the, the differing regulations and whatnot? Um, so, so yeah, it's an, it's an understanding of what needs to change and, and, um, the, to comply with the different regulations, I guess. Right. So, so you're essentially looking at what this company does in state A and they're doing A to Z, right? Because under the regulations in that specific state, they're allowed to do A to Z, right? But now they want to open up in a different state and regulations are now like one to 10, right? Completely different things, right? So you guys assist with kind of molding their existing kind of not just business model, but the way their entire business operates right from a foundational level and then molding that towards what that new state requires from them. Is that the the 30,000 foot overview of kind of (laughs) how you would kind of work with these companies? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that. I mean, just as a, a small example, say they have um, their procedures in place and their originating state, we could take a look at that and see what needs to change as a very simple model right there. <laughs> right, right. I mean, yeah, like, you know, I find a lot of times or just me personally, I get super, super technical in a lot of the things, but obviously people who are just wanting to get an idea, they can always get in contact afterwards and kind of figure out what they want to do from there. Yeah. Um, so what I also found interesting or, I'm you know, continuing to look into is like the psychedelic space, right? It's like, oh, we got mushrooms, we got all these different things going on. And I'm like, wait, hold your horses. Like we have still yet federally legalized this <laughs> cannabis. So, you know, we'll see what happens, right? But I, I do see small things popping up like these, um, uh, what are they? Uh, they're not resorts, but they're like getaways. I forgot what the name would be, but it'd be like- uh, uh, Yeah, I think the official term is like um, assisted therapy treatment centers. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. But not just that, but there's also- not companies, but I do think a group of like-minded people who are going to go to a specific location to ingest specific things. Um, What are you seeing in terms of progress and movement in the psychedelic space? Like, what are your thoughts about, I guess, one, you know, the legalization of it, like, and and then kind of like when you think it's going to happen and when you think it's going to come, you know, mainstream sort of thing. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a really interesting time for it and to see the progress of it. I, I think about it in kind of similar to how cannabis came to be. Um, you know, we, we first recognized it and, and did trials, clinical trials and research on uh, the potential medicinal and therapeutic benefits and um, from created awareness and, and from there got medical legalization in certain areas and kind of from there develops into um, recreational uses and you know, kind of tearing away the stigma a little bit, a little bit by little bit. And, um, you know, now it's, um, you know, expanding in multiple states across the country and hopefully we'll get that, you know, federal um, legalization soon. But I kind of see a similar kind of trajectory with psychedelics um, with the, uh, the the clinical trials and the research that are going into it, um, you know, Oregon already has the legalization for um, and we're beginning to you know re- have a regulatory model for licensing. Um, Sorry, Oregon have... has already legalized it, or they're in the process of. So yeah, they're developing um, a regulatory framework to oh. actually um, to license uh, like the psilocybin essentially for. Right in a similar kind of way to cannabis. Um, so it's, I kind of see it as kind of going from there and um, following the, the, the cannabis model and um, with increased just education um, and seeing the, 
the medical benefits, the potential therapeutic benefits out there. Um, I think it will, people will be, um, are continuing to be more accepting of it on a, on a personal use level. Right. And so, yeah, I think eventually, I don't know when, I mean, I think we're still a long ways in terms of any type, type of federal legalization for right. psychedelics, but um, I think eventually, yeah, we'll get there. Right, right. You think, you, you know, are you thinking 10 plus 20 plus or five? Um, I would probably say maybe 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, Um, that's, that's reasonable. Uh, And then cannabis probably, what do you think about cannabis in terms of federal legalization? I mean, I feel like every year it changes, you know, I say, oh, (laughs) next year or now five years, you know, (laughs) but, um, you know, I think we're, we're getting closer. We're definitely getting closer. Um, maybe, maybe within the next five years, you know, maybe we'll all get a lucky break and we'll get some good news this year, but, um, we'll see how things happen. (laughs) I mean, I think ultimately with the governments and stuff, it really is just, just money talks, right? It's like, once they see that this place is making X amount of additional millions, hundreds or tens of millions of dollars, they're gonna be like, oh, I need a piece of that pie now. Now it's time to go, right? Um, yeah, yeah it's, it, it is very, very interesting how we're going to progress in this space because it's like it's like the first time we're just kind of doing it, right? And it's just kind of like, what the heck's going on, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the psychedelics market, they've got big projections already to be a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, I mean, the ketamine trials are already multi-million dollar right. industry. So it's definitely catching the eyes of investors out there who want to get into the space. And so, yeah, as you said, I mean, money talks and can um, yeah. really push it forward. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're getting, you know, con- different countries. And I think it was, it's Thailand, I think, that like started this whole, like they created like this green day type thing. Um, and yeah. like they fully, fully legalized where like marijuana was like the biggest like issue there. Um, and they've just kind of gone all in, the government's gone all in saying, Hey, this is a herb, you know, it doesn't kill people, all that fun stuff. Right. Um, so, yeah. you know, as not only just the different States, you know, we have Canada, we have the States, but we have different countries, you know, you know, in the Eastern hemisphere, right. That's kind of like even more kind of like locked down on like cannabis and stuff like that. I do think that again, it's just going to be more so like an exponential effect. Like as more people do it, more people are just going to go ahead and do it. Um, But it isn't going to be interesting to see what this space looks like in the next five ish years. And then on your end, I'm sure it's going to be very fun how those regulations then end up changing based on what is going on. Right. Yeah. yeah, All all it's going to take is one bad thing to happen. They're going to be like, Nope, can't do this anymore. Then you guys will have to go ahead and write, rewrite all of the SOPs that you've done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, they change all the time. I feel like they change way too frequently. And um, right. you know, as you're saying, uh, the seeing Thailand legalize what was a really nice surprise, really kind of big moment. I feel like for the industry as a whole. Um, but but yeah, I mean, even just um, you know, if you remember like the vaping epidemic, which happened. Oh, right of years ago um they want to ban even you know vaping for for cannabis now um right, right. So well they banned jewels right yeah jewels are now banned um and I think cannabis will be next um so it's yeah there is you never know what to expect on a day-to-day um, right. in this industry um keeps it exciting though. <laughs> oh, no, that's exactly what I was going to say, right? If things are too similar and you're doing the same thing every day, then it, it'll end up getting boring despite how stressful, I guess, it can be yeah. sometimes for lack of a better word. Um, so, um, you know, kind of getting into now, you know, I, I guess the value for, for the dispensary owners and stuff like that, right? Um, I always like to ask this question to all my guests because the, the reason why I have this podcast is to um, get expertise in just different fields that I've just no clue about, right? Um, so next question is, is like, you know, what do you see kind of dispensary owners doing right now? And what do you think they can do now to take it to the next level, right? And that next level is really whatever you deem it as, right? It could be marketing, sales, it could be something on the regulation side, but really, you know, what do you think dispensary owners should be doing now to kind of like, set themselves apart from the rest of their competitors. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there, I think there's a trend and a lot of um, dispensary owners are uh, seeing um, the value of what the consumer wants um, in terms of, you know, 
environmental sustainability products, you know, and what you're doing um, to give back to your communities as well. I think being accountable um, for the being in the industry and in terms of counteracting the effects of the war on drugs, you know, being equitable um, is a huge, a huge factor that we all need to implement um, in terms of uh, hiring standards, um, vendors that you work with, you know, I think supporting, um, you know, equity businesses as a whole is, you know, it's very important. We have to have that accountability on a, on a broad, on a broad scale. Um, so understanding, you know, what the consumers want and, and what, having that accountability, I think is, uh, will right. hopefully be successful. Right, right. I mean, that's huge. And like, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of, of essentially that, right? I, I, I think that when a lot of these businesses opened up, it was very much, oh, I can make so much money because this is this new and novel thing. And you know what I mean? Um, and it was very much like a money grab, right? It's like, how many stores can I open up? And at the end of the day, your business, like I get it, you have to make money, right? Um, but at the end of the day, like if you can't also find a way to contribute to society, again, whatever that means to you, whether it's helping the people, helping the planet, or kind of innovating on whatever service it is. Um, I do think that there is like a lost opportunity there. Cause like, I think if all businesses can kind of not just have their main priority be making money, but also how can you just, you know, do something better? You know what I mean? Um, I, I'm, I'm very happy you mentioned, you know, you mentioned that. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. <laughs> and then I guess any additional nuggets of wisdom that you'd like to share? Um, I think that, um, you know, kind of like what I, what I touched on um, is, you know, making sure that you have someone on your, in your corner to make sure that you are staying um, in line with the regulations on the compliance standard um, accounting, you know, good accounting principles, record keeping principles and things like that. Um, you know, mergers and actual acquisitions right now are really big. Um, so transferring, buying, licensing, uh, licenses, things like that. So would really stress the importance of doing your due diligence and um, get the, uh, your research on the company that you're, you're buying from, right. uh, making sure there's nothing, you know, sketchy that um you know that's going on there so i've seen a lot of issues in that in that area in that sector uh with m a so right. doing the appropriate due diligence if that's right. something that you're interested in or, or going down is uh, crucial right well now that you bring that up um i'm very curious like are you finding people are just doing the whole licensing regulation stuff then getting the store approved and then selling that to like the highest bidder that doesn't need to go through that process like is that a thing or yeah, I have seen it kind of like license flipping. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah, so I mean, the getting the license it, it itself has value in it. So um, you know, people have seen an opportunity to want to just get the license and then yeah, turn it over and, and sell it to to an investor or or company. Um, yeah, absolutely, it's out there. Awesome. Oh, I don't know if that's awesome, but I mean, look, there's, <laughs> when, when people can buy and sell, people are going to buy and sell no matter what it is, right? Um, and if there's a value exchange, people people pay more for that, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so I just, you know, I took a bunch of notes again, because I'm just very curious, uh, just I'm super happy we were able to talk about this. But, you know, you know, the main things that we kind of spoke about was in terms of the biggest reasons for people rejecting or getting rejected from applications is, you know, the the materials part the background check and the capital, right? Those are kind of the three main things. Um, and then in terms of the capital, ideally you want in the range of like 100 to 250K, you know, at least to yeah. start, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at least yeah. to start. Um, and then on the the issues, right? Typically it's, you know, again, capital, but like the, the, the property, right? The property pays a pretty big, uh, obstacle and, and, you know, kind of people getting licenses. Um, and then after that, for people who do have the license and congratulations, you've got it, make sure you don't mess it up by making sure that your taxes and counting is good. And then you're obviously good for inspections and stuff like that. Um, does that cover most of it? Again, that's super, super high level. You guys do a million times more things than that. But again, just for whoever's listening and whoever just fast forwards through the, through the video, just want to summarize <laughs> kind of like exactly, you know, what the main things to look out for is that about right or is there anything else yeah i think that that touches it um you know there's the main things that you need to be on the lookout uh watch out for in terms of going from beginning to end <laughs> right 
Right. So um, if uh, if anybody needs any any help, you know, hit up Jenna and uh, <laughs> she will let you know how to get in contact. So feel free to plug all of your stuff. Oh, um, yeah, contact us at um, cannabislicenseexpert.com. Um, there is a chat window there where you can talk to someone directly onto the website um, and you can give us a call and we'll be happy to help you. Awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for hopping on another episode of the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. Um, as usual, I'm your host, Brandon Kwan, founder of Cannabis Marketing, uh, the number one marketing agency for cannabis dispensaries, both in the US and in Canada. And I will see you on the next show. Thanks again, guys. Bye.